This is a CBC Original Podcast. If you are a true crime detective in your spare time, why not check out some of Audible's top picks, like Mindhunter, Inside the FBI's Elite Serial Crime Unit, or other true crime stories. Audible lets you experience books in a whole new way, where stories are brought to life by powerful performances from renowned actors and narrators. With the free Audible app, you can listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're at home, in the car, or on a jog. The first 30 days of Audible membership are free, including a free book. Go to www.audible.ca slash SKS to learn more. Hello, SKS listeners. I'm hard at work on season five of SKS, but in the meantime, I wanted to recommend another investigative podcast from CBC. It's called Missing and Murdered, and it's hosted and investigated by my friend and colleague, Connie Walker. I worked with Connie for years on the same show here at CBC. She's award-winning and inspiring and has done some very powerful stories, many about Indigenous people and communities from across Canada. Stories that are too often overlooked and underreported. The first season of Missing and Murder discovered new evidence in the 1989 cold case of Alberta Williams, a 24-year-old Indigenous woman who was found murdered along the Highway of Tears in British Columbia. Connie uncovered new potential suspects in Alberta's case. In season two, Connie investigates the impact of the 60s scoop when tens of thousands of Indigenous children were taken from their families by Canadian government agencies and adopted out to mostly white families across North America and beyond. Six children from the Samaganus family were taken from their Cree mother in Saskatchewan and given new families and new names. Years later, the siblings found their way back to each other, all except for Cleo. This is episode one of Missing and Murdered, season two, Finding Cleo. You can hear the rest of the episodes wherever you get your podcasts. I encourage you to subscribe. I go walk. It's almost like walk. Can I go walk? Can I make? Okay, sorry. Can I have it again? There's a phrase in Cree that I've been practicing. I'm not a Cree speaker, but my dad was, and I took a few classes in university, so I learned some of the basics. Tanse, which is hello, peyak ni so ni sto, one, two, three. A tim is dog. Clearly, I'm not fluent. But after months of working on this story, I really wanted to start this season with this Cree phrase. Kigwai ka'agawak tamik. It literally means something wanting it, as in wishing or longing for something. I wanted to learn how to say that in Cree because for the last several months, I've been immersed in the story of a Cree family from Saskatchewan, a family where nearly every single person that we've talked to has endured a lifetime of longing. Kigwai ka'agawak tamik. Longing for a home and a culture they lost. Longing for healing from childhood trauma. Longing for answers to lifelong mysteries. Longing for the love of a family they were taken from as children. Longing for a sister who was lost. Kigwai ka'agawak tamik. I'm Connie Walker, and this is Missing and Murdered, Finding Cleo, an investigative podcast by CBC News. To have your family member stolen, murdered, then missing? Oh, wait a minute. This is Cleo. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. The government can get away with things if it doesn't, if nobody knows it you know, what happens. Yeah, I'm not sure that information is correct. She was driven away and I went the other way. And I've been looking for her ever since. I promised I'd find her and eventually I will. She tried her darndest to get back to Canada and see her family. She did everything within her power to get back there. In my heart, I think that killed her. 
Are you recording me? Yes, is that okay? No, it's not. I've done a lot of reporting on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, but I've never heard a story like this before. Hi, Christine. Hi. Connie, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Come on in. This is Christine Cameron. I met her apartment in North Bay, Ontario. I'm here because Christine reached out to me and asked for help to find her sister, Cleo. As soon as she told me about Cleo's story, I knew it was something I wanted to investigate. Hey, Tulu. Christine doesn't want her son, Tulu, to hear our conversation. What did you complain in the room? To hear the details about his Aunt Cleo's death and to hear the call that we're about to make. So do you think that you would be up for calling oh, sure. him today? Yeah. Why not? I brought a phone number with me, a number for someone that we think might have the answers that Christine has been searching for. Um, how do you feel about, you know, ca- calling and asking for help and, and for answers? Well, the last time I talked to them, they weren't very forthcoming or cooperative or even supportive in any way. Hello, you've reached the mailbox of Terry Payton. Please leave a message after the tone. Yeah, hi, Carrie. My name is uh, Christine Cameron. I'm calling from North Bay, Ontario. My number is 7054... Um, if you could return my call as soon as possible, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, maybe she's just screening her calls. I'll still try to find this. Christine says she's made calls like this before. She's left messages, written letters, but she's never been able to reach the right person. This isn't a typical missing persons case, because Cleo didn't just disappear. Christine says Cleo was stolen, then murdered, and is now missing, and she has been for decades. Okay, I need to back up here and explain things a bit. When Christine reached out to me, she sent me a story that she wrote about her search for Cleo. My sister Cleo died in 1975. She was 11 years old and was apprehended by the province of Saskatchewan and sent to Arkansas to a foster family where she was abused. My sister Cleo was 11 years old and remembered where she lived and who loved her. Whatever happened to her in Arkansas to make her want to leave, it wasn't good. She tried to hitchhike back to Little Pine, back home to the reserve, but was picked up, raped, and murdered, and left by the side of the road. 11-year-old Cleo was hitchhiking back home when she was picked up, raped, murdered, and left by the side of the road. But here's the thing. That's all that Christine and her entire family know about Cleo's death. They don't know where she was buried. They don't know if anyone was ever charged in her murder. They don't even know if Cleo was still her name. And although she wrote in her story that Cleo died in 1975, Christine admits that might not be true. She doesn't know exactly when Cleo died, just that it was sometime in the 1970s, after Cleo was sent to live with a family in the United States. Do you think you could show us the picture of Cleo that you have up there? Sure. Do you mind taking it down? In fact, the only concrete proof Christine has of Cleo's existence is this tiny photo. In a silver frame and an oval on my piano is a picture of my sister. Very small, maybe an inch and a half tall, and that is all that remains. Cleo Semagonis Nicotine, my oldest sister. Sometimes I wake up and I think I'm still in a dream. Sometimes that happens to all of us. But this is a dream I cannot wake up from. Wondering constantly, would she be helping me with my kids now? Would she braid my hair and have sisterly advice? It's a small little thing. Yeah. How old would Cleo be here, do you know? She would have been about nine, nine or ten because she was 11 when she died. The picture looks like a classic school photo. The first time I saw it, it immediately grabbed me. I felt like I recognized her, like maybe she could have been someone I knew growing up on the reserve. I think she looks a little bit younger than Christine says, maybe six or seven years old. It's old and faded, so hard to say for sure, but no doubt, Cleo is a cute kid. She's wearing a striped turtleneck, 
Her dark hair is cut short, and her little bangs are cut crookedly over her big brown eyes. And she's looking straight into the lens without even a tiny bit of a smile. I know it's just a photo, but Cleo looks like a serious child. As soon as I saw the picture and read Christine's story, I wondered how something like this could have happened. How could a family go on for so many years without knowing what happened to their sister? I knew that I wanted to help find Cleo and to find out the truth about her life and death. I do not know her birth date. I do not know her full name. I do not know her resting place nor the exact date of her death. I do not know how she might have liked her eggs in the morning or what her favorite color was or what she liked to sing. But I do know that my kids would have loved their Aunt Cleo, would have reveled in her presence, these people that look like me. Christine is in her mid-40s now, and although she was very young when they were separated, Cleo is still such a huge part of her life. Cleo's spirit is very much alive. She stares at me across time, asking to come home. Over and over again, I dream of her and try to find something new to find her grave. It may even be unmarked. It's such a mystery, such an impossible task to find her and bring her home. But I still have hope. Along with her son Tulu, Christine has three other older kids and helps look after her granddaughter. (laughs) But she dreams of going back to school to study art. Can you show me something? Well, this one here is a work in progress. I did that. Um, that's a painting of Cleo, what I think she would look like if she were older. Because I looked at that picture and tried to envision what she would look like if she were still alive. The painting is of a woman with brown skin and brown eyes. Her dark hair is long and there are streaks of silver that started her bangs. Christine says this is a painting of Cleo, but I think it looks exactly like Christine. Yeah, people say that, but I wasn't trying to paint me. I was trying to paint my sister. Looking at Christine's vision of Cleo makes me wonder if her longing to find answers about her sister is also a longing to find answers about herself, about her own childhood. Because when Christine was just a baby, she and Cleo and all of their siblings were taken from their mother by child welfare authorities and put up for adoption. So what was your name when you were born? Crystal Marie Annabelle Samaganis. And how old were you when you were um, taken into foster care? Uh, I was less than a year old. You guys are scattered all around. Yes, yes we are. Christine is the baby in her big family, the youngest of six kids, Johnny, Mark, April, Annette, and Cleo. After all of the Semaganist children were apprehended by child welfare authorities, they were put in temporary foster homes until they were all adopted into white families. The Semaganist kids ended up in towns and cities across North America. Is there anyone on this planet who can help us? Please, I cannot do this alone. Help us find her. In the story she wrote, you can hear Christine's pain and longing. It's raw and fuels her desire to find Cleo. And for justice, because Christine believes that she and Cleo and all of their siblings never should have been taken away from their biological mother. Christine believes that if they had stayed with their mom, Cleo would still be alive. When we were originally apprehended, my, my adoptive mother had told me that I, I was abused. I said, what? She goes, yeah, your, your bum was blue. And she goes, but then we started realizing that when the spot stayed there and you were three years old, four years old, it was still there, then we realized, no, no, you weren't abused. I know what Christine is talking about. I've seen this birthmark that looks like a bruise. It's called a Mongolian spot. Apparently, it's quite common in Indigenous kids, but it goes away as they get older. I said, well, why didn't you say something or give me back? Because we didn't have to. Was what they told me. Oh, okay. Christine grew up a few hours from where she was born, in a small town in rural Saskatchewan. So I was a very quiet child. 
and I tried to make things up by being, you know, excelling in school and joining all these clubs. I tried to overcompensate by, you know, just to be accepted. Christine has always wondered what her life would be like if she hadn't been adopted, if she hadn't grown up a brown girl in a white family. Oh, here's a couple of pictures of me yeah. growing up. That's me as a girl guide. See, look, little Miss Brown face in amongst all these, all these non-native. And then there would be a few instances too when, you know, other kids would say stuff like, call me like wagon partner, and I wouldn't know the origin of that. Or squash, stuff like that. It was all a mystery to me. But you knew the intent behind it. Yeah, I knew I was different. Squaw and wagon burner. So much of Christine's story resonates with me because I also grew up a brown girl that stood out among the white students in a small town in rural Saskatchewan. I remember hearing my first racist taunt on the playground, but Christine didn't have anyone at home who could really understand what that was like and what she was going through. I remember growing up, my grandmother used to say, when we adopted you, you became a white person. That might have been how my family perceived me, but that's not how society saw me. Because, you know, my family's got blue eyes. My mother has light brown hair, and my father was Scottish. He had uh, black hair, blue eyes, and I looked nothing like them. I always knew. Hearing Christine talk about how different she felt makes me think of Cleo. Did she feel like an outsider in her adoptive family? In her school? In her community? Did your parents tell you anything about why they adopted you? My mother was um, pretty blunt about things, but why she adopted me. She said if they waited for a little white girl, they'd be waiting for five or six years, but they could have me right away. They told me that they would never have to pay for my education. And that's why they adopted me. Christine's parents told her they'd never have to pay for her education, and that's why they adopted an Indigenous child. Christine's relationship with her adoptive parents eventually broke down, and she doesn't speak to them anymore. That's something I've actually heard quite a bit, with Indigenous kids being adopted into non-Indigenous homes. Some researchers say that most adoptees become estranged from their parents, and it must have been that way for Cleo as well. Why else would she try to leave her adoptive family and get back to Saskatchewan? Growing up, Christine felt the same longing to reconnect with her biological family. The desire to know who she was and where she came from only intensified. Did you ever talk to your your parents about any of that? I imagine those would be difficult conversations if you did. I was close with my dad. Not so much my mother, but um, in a way I didn't want to hurt them by asking them, right? Even though I really, really wanted to know. Because I'm not saying they're horrible. I'm just saying that some of their attitudes and worldviews about Native people didn't really jive with who was living in their house, right? So um, I didn't really want to hurt them when I was living there, under their house. So I didn't really ask, even though I really, really wanted to know. And then when I turned 18, they had an envelope filled with all the information they just left it on the buffet in the kitchen and said it's there if you want to look at it Whoa. so I, I left it there for a couple of weeks before I actually opened it did you know that that was going to happen when you turned 18 no did you, did you did you know what was in the documents no I just left it there for a while because you know there's your whole life sitting in an envelope you look at it or not what made you decide to finally look at it Overwhelming curiosity. Christine was finally going to get some answers about her biological family. But the information that she found in that envelope didn't satisfy her curiosity. It fueled her desire to learn more. So what was in the envelope when you when you opened it? It was uh, my adoption papers. It was a couple little uh, photographs. And it had my original name in it. That's the first time I learned of my original name. I remember thinking... I could be reading about this but any Joe Blow on the street, right? It was just so detached and weird. My entire life just reduced to five or six pages and a couple little clippings of photographs of things that could have been. It was just very surreal. 
in those papers, Christine learned she had biological siblings and a mother she could meet. I think the first time I met her when I was uh, 19, I knew it was her because she looked like me. Oh my gosh, I have a huge lump in my throat. I can't imagine what that was like. That was when you were 19? Yeah. She just kept saying, I love you, and she was happy. And I remember just staring at her for a long time. Christine's mom's name was Lillian Semaganis, a Cree woman from the Little Pine First Nation in northern Saskatchewan. Not long after reconnecting with her mother, Christine learned that her sister Cleo had been murdered. After meeting more of her biological family, Christine heard about the day that Lillian got the news that Cleo had died. All I know from family members is it was 1975 or 1976. There was a powwow happening in their community, and Lillian showed up, distraught, and she was carrying a letter informing her that Cleo had died. Apparently it happened in Arkansas. But no one in the family knows exactly who wrote that letter to Lillian or when she got it. She was trying to hitchhike back, and she was picked up, raped, and murdered, and she was buried in Arkansas. I looked at a map of the United States. If Cleo had started in Arkansas, the journey back to her small reserve in northern Saskatchewan would have been 27 hours by car. And if she was hitchhiking, she could have passed through Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas before even entering Canada. No one knows which route Cleo took, or how far she made it, or even when she left. And not having those details makes it really hard to search for any information. Believe me, I tried searching. Girl killed in Arkansas in the 70s. And I came across some really terrible stories. But nothing that sounded even remotely like Cleo. Nobody knows her adoptive name. Nobody knows her birthday. Christine hasn't been sure where to turn for answers about Cleo's death, but she believes she knows exactly who was responsible. I don't blame my mother for what happened in our lives. I blame the Canadian government. That's where I squarely place blame. Because the Canadian government sought to assimilate Native children by saying... You are better raised in a non-native home and not by your own people. So in denying a whole race of people, a whole generation of kids like me and to the other scoopers, denying us a community, a heritage, a culture, a language, a whole lifestyle that we were made for. We were dumped into something foreign, something unwelcome, something abusive, something segregating, something isolating. When Christine says scoopers, what she's referring to is something called the 60s scoop. It's when tens of thousands of Indigenous kids in Canada were taken from their homes by child welfare authorities and adopted into white families in Canada, the United States, and beyond. In Saskatchewan, where the Semaganis kids were born, the government actually placed the kids they wanted to adopt out in ads, in newspapers, on the radio, and on TV. Have you ever considered adopting a child? Many couples have found their happiness through AIM. It was part of a program called AIM, Adopt Indian and Métis. Essentially, the goal was adopting out the large number of Indigenous kids they had in the child welfare system. Children lost their connection to their families, their language, their culture, and many experienced abuse and trauma. I want to find out more about why the Saskatchewan government created the AIM program that would lead to so many broken lives. Christine believes the government's goal was to assimilate Indigenous kids. It isn't AIM that makes children happy. It's you. That's why I blame the government. They could have made other choices. They could have sought to, you know, empower the Native community by giving them better services, by allowing extended family to care for their children like they do today. But, you know, the government knows best. As much as Christine blames the government, 
she realizes that the only place she can go to for answers about Cleo is back to the same people that took her away in the first place, the Saskatchewan government's social services. Yeah, the post-adoption registry, or what is, what is it, what did I call them back then? Adoption Support Centre Saskatchewan. They're not very supportive. But getting the information she wanted wasn't that simple. Christine was told that in order to get answers about Cleo, she needed her biological mother's cooperation. They said, okay, well, there's a package you need to fill. All your mom has to do is sign it. So I took this big package, I don't know, it was seven, eight pages. I filled the whole thing out as much as I could. And then that's when I brought it to my mother about a month or so after and said, all you need to do is sign, and she refused to sign. She just, she said, I'm not doing that? Yeah, she said, you're going to have to wait till I die. Did you wonder why? Not really, because I think human beings do the things they do for a reason and that... It wasn't my choice, it was hers, and um, all the life she had with no choice, I could at least allow her one choice to make and respect that choice. Lillian Semaginis died in 2014. For years, out of respect for her mother, Christine waited to find answers about Cleo. But after her mother's death, she began calling and writing letters to the Saskatchewan government, but was never able to get any information about her sister. Do you have any consolation that they are trying to follow a process? I, I would imagine they would say to protect people involved. I think that the people involved with Cleo are the people still asking questions like me and my brothers and my sister who want to know. We've always been asking those questions, but I'm an Indian woman. My sister was an Indian woman. She's been dead for 40 years. And the government has said, basically continues to say, well, we'll get around to it. You know, dismissive, paternalistic, authoritative attitude towards my inquiries. But today we gave Christine the name and number of the person who works at Social Services in Saskatchewan, who actually has Cleo's file. And when she calls back, Christine says she's not taking no for an answer. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, this is them. Yes, government of Sask. Can you oh my gosh. Move your mic over? Call from Gift Hope. Good afternoon, this is Christine speaking. Hi, Christine. This is Social Services in Saskatchewan. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm calling to obtain information about my deceased sister, Cleopatra Nicotine Samaginus. And we were all adopted in the mid-1970s. I know my Christine tries to explain to the woman from the Saskatchewan government this complicated story of her family's search for Cleo. The government of Saskatchewan has had thousands of First Nations and Métis kids in care over the past 40 years but we have no way of knowing if they've ever encountered a situation like this before. We really want to obtain any information regarding her adoption, where she was placed and where she might be, because right now we don't have anything at all. Okay, so you're not aware of um, like the adoption agency in the States? No clue. I couldn't. I can't even. Last time I spoke with the post adoption registry, they told me that because she was an, a, an officially adopted in the state of Arkansas, that she was their responsibility, and they they had no authority to tell me anything. Her name is Cleopatra. Yeah. Cle- can you tell me her last name? Uh, it would have been Nicotine. I mean, Samaginus Nicotine. Samaginus was my birth mother's uh, maiden name. And then. Do you, do you know her date of birth? I know absolutely nothing other than oh, okay. the fact that she existed. All I have is a little picture of her. So would you share a birth father with her then? You no, so? no, no. We had uh, different fathers. Different fathers. Okay, I want to stop here and explain why we've never mentioned Cleo's father. It's basically because we have no idea who he is. In Christine's story, she says Cleo's full name is Cleopatra Semaginus Nicotine. So we're assuming that nicotine was her father's last name, but we don't actually know. And then I I am going to be looking into what other information we can share. Uh, Right now, the regulations don't allow us to share, like, file information between siblings. 
Okay. But it doesn't. But I'm going to look into it. I'm going to check with our legal and see if there is a way that we can get that information to you. Mm -hmm. um, it might. It might uh, involve a little bit of research on finding out um, where where she was adopted. So we'll have to work with them and see if they'll either release that information to us or to you in order to share it. You mean Arkansas or in Saskatchewan? You you mean Arkansas? Um. If, well, from what I understand, that's where she was adopted, officially adopted. Right, from the place where she was adopted. Okay, what, what would happen if there is a father listed on her birth certificate? We would actually uh, do the search to see if he's still alive. And if he is, we will have to maybe provide the information to him or get re approval to release it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Essentially, what I think she's saying is that biological siblings aren't really entitled to the same information as biological parents. Christine might need permission from Cleo's father first. And even if she's able to get Cleo's birth certificate, and even though she was adopted from Saskatchewan, Christine will have to go to the government of Arkansas to get more information about her death. Okay, let's say things don't go well. What What's the worst case scenario in, regarding my inquiries and uh, pursuit for information for my sister? Worst case scenario? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that the, uh, that the information wouldn't be able to be shared. Uh, yeah, okay. it's hard for me to say right now. I'm sorry. And just before the call ended, Christine asked one last question. And I was shocked when I heard the answer. And then my, one of my final questions is, have you, have you your office had any experience dealing with Arkansas adoption agencies to facilitate the, the successful transfer of information? With Arkansas? Yeah. Um, I don't recall another instance with Arkansas, no. Mm, okay. <clears throat> I just, yeah, I'm not sure that information is correct. Oh, well, how do you know yeah. it's correct or not? Yeah. Pardon? How would you know it's correct or not? Because, uh, like I said, we've been, we have some of the information oh. from your file. Well, it would be nice to have some sort of information. You know, as a sibling, you know, it's been 40 years. Yes. <laughs> and for 20 years, you've told me nothing. <laughs> I know. This is my sister. Her body's in the States, you know? Mm-hmm. Do you have a sister? I do. Well, then maybe think about how I feel and really try your best. Because if you know she's not in Arkansas, then find a way to tell me where she is. Okay, that's what I'm going to work on. Please. Okay. So I will call you by tomorrow at the latest to let you know where I'm at. All right. Okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks for calling. Okay, thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. So they do know, they're just not telling me. They know where she is. But they know where she is. Cleo might not have been adopted into Arkansas? If not there, where did she end up? Okay, she's not in Arkansas then. I wonder where she is. They know. They know where she is. Well, that's kind of hopeful. Kind of uh, infuriating. So she probably has the whole file and all my old letters and all the answers right in front of her. I'm, I'm just shocked that she said that might not be correct. Oh yeah, I picked up on that right away. How do you know it's not correct? Because you, because in my heart, I believe they know where she is. I've always believed that. I've only been involved in this for a very short time, but I just can't imagine waiting till the even the end of tomorrow to find out what information you'll be able to get. Whatever information I'll be grateful for. I believe this whole thing is your whole life. The very least they could do is tell me the truth. Christine is convinced that based on that conversation with social services, her family has been wrong about Cleo's death, that she wasn't adopted into Arkansas. And if that information isn't correct, 
What else could they be wrong about? This is all just news to me, so... Uh, how are you guys feeling? I can't imagine. On the next Missing and Murdered, Finding Cleo, Christine gets new information about her sister Cleo's death and the first real clue about the truth. If, if, you, if anything's difficult, you don't have to read it. She has not shown any symptoms of homesickness and settled well into her first home. She does sometimes apparently mention her siblings. Missing and Murdered, Finding Cleo is written and hosted by me, Connie Walker. Our producers are Marnie Luke and Jennifer Fowler. Mika Anderson is our audio producer, and our senior producer is Heather Evans. To subscribe to our podcast, search Missing and Murdered, Finding Cleo on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. You can also listen to the podcast on our website at cbc.ca slash findingcleo. To see the only photo that Christine has of her sister, visit cbc.ca slash findingcleo. For more CBC Original Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash originalpodcasts.